Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the RSA. My name's Joe Hallgart, and I'm Director of Creative Learning and Development here at the RSA, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's special event. Today's event is held in partnership with Read On, Get On, the UK-wide campaign to ensure that by 2025, every child leaves primary school able to read well and enjoying reading as well. Uh, do follow the links on the RSA website to find out more about the campaign and how you can get involved. Before we begin, could I just ask you to all t put your mobile phones to silent. We're filming today and also live streaming over the web. So welcome to everybody watching online. And a reminder, the hashtag today is RSA Reading. If you do want to get involved in the discussion on tw Twitter, we would really welcome questions from Twitter that then we will, we will put, to the, put to the participants later. Uh, as the hashtag suggests, today we're looking at the issue of how we foster a lifelong love of reading in children from an early age and consider whether the, the delights and distractions of our digital age and our digital devices make that an easier or a more challenging task. As digital media play an ever greater role in children's lives, how do we develop creative approaches to learning and literacy to capitalise on the benefits of technology yet remain human-centred and inclusive? So that's our key question for today's session, and we've gathered a really good group of experts to help us tackle it. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Michael Levine, then from Natalia Kuchikova, uh, then from Jonathan Douglas, and finally from Kate Wilson. I'll talk a little bit about uh, them later, but first of all, from Michael. Michael is founding director of the Joan Gantz Cooney Center in the US, an independent non-profit organization based at, the based at the Sesame Workshop, which is the team behind Sesame Street. Uh, Michael is the co-author uh, with Lisa Guernsey of Tap, Click, Read, Growing Readers in a World of Screens. And he'll talk partly about, about that book today. Yeah, Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Wow, what a great turnout. It's my pleasure to be here at this prestigious venue. I cannot tell you how much I value the work of the academics and the literacy trust and the book trust and the work of great developers like Nosy Crow. It's just a privilege to, to be here. So as Joe suggested, I'm going to kick things off by giving you a bit of an overview of a recent book that I wrote with Lisa Guernsey called Tap, Click, Read, Growing Readers in a World of Screens. Um, our team spent uh, three years studying the research on digital media and literacy. We interviewed about 100 experts around the globe. We conducted an extensive review of the app's marketplace, it's complicated, and spent time in academic and industry labs looking for breakthrough products and models. We were amazed by the amount of activity in this arena on the one hand and the, unfortunately, lack of progress and clear strategy in supporting early literacy learning on the other. We wrote the book because, frankly, we were outraged. Um, I have a hard time sleeping at night knowing that more than two-thirds of America's fourth graders cannot read well. Um, the numbers are somewhat better, but still dismal, frankly, here in the, in the UK. For children in low-income families and children of color, the numbers are even worse. Eight in 10 are not reading at grade level by the time they are 10. And, dis and this is just, it's not like we haven't been paying attention to this. This is just despite billions of dollars and billions of pounds that are spent on programs. So the percentage really hasn't budged for the last two decades. And in the book, we refer to this as America's quiet crisis. So we mapped out a thoroughly modern approach looking at the role that digital technology could play in helping ch young children embrace literacy of all kinds with a particular emphasis on reading. Um, and we seek out what we call a third way by avoiding the tired nagging of no screen time advocates and what I would refer to as the overheated enthusiasm of technophiles who position apps as the holy grail of early education. Um, instead of focusing on whether kids have new tablets or the right apps, we argue that communities need to take stock of whether children have literacy opportunities everywhere they go and assess whether they are meeting the needs of their most underserved families. We ask in the book, and I think that you're all asking this question right here, right now, is there a cohesive strategy to how we are using libraries and early learning centers, public media stations and after school programs as informal and formal learning opportunities in the ways in which technology is integrated 
And the answer is no, not yet. There is no coherent strategy. For example, our research shows that more than 75% of children live in homes with mobile technologies, but little attention is paid to how they're using those devices and the ways in which parents, teachers, and librarians could be helping them use media to learn. And before you ask me no, we do not advocate putting babies in front of screens by themselves. Infants and toddlers and older children too desperately need social interaction and meaningful conversation with their parents and caregivers. But when screens are used in joint engagement, such as the invention of Sesame Street, which was uh, you know, a classic intergenerational learning opportunity, when we have that kind of learning together, those serve and return moments, when we use picture books as a jumping off point for conversation, or even just exchanges of curious glances or laughter, or when we use great apps like Nosy Crow, which you'll be hearing about, they can become very powerful tools for learning. So how do we propose in the book and elsewhere we're going to solve the global reading crisis? We contend that our society needs to see technology framed in a totally new role, not as a communications advocate, not as a productivity driver, not as, not as any of these things. We need to look at technologies as a human relationship builder, not as a solution by itself. We need to recognize the power of parents, educators, and media in combination with each other. In the book, we sum up four Cs. First, we need to worry about the quality of the content. Nosy Crow is a whole lot better than a lot of the junk that you see out there. There's a lot of good stuff. Parents are not finding it. Second, we need to worry about the context of the interaction. This second C is all about knowing that there's a big difference between parking your child in front of, um, in, in front of a tablet or, a, or another screen for an hour versus having them interact with their grandparents for 30 minutes of video chat. Third, we need to tune into the needs and the problems of, and the passions of individual children. Parents and educators know kids best, and we need to really tune into the diverse children that you know, live around the globe. And fourth, we're not doing a very good job of maximizing and leveraging the cultural assets. For example, um, uh, second language learning in the states is particularly underrepresented in the ways in which we're using digital technologies. So to better practice the four C's, we need powerful exemplars and what I'm calling a new framing or a new narrative around this more nuanced role for early tech experiences. So our book uses video and storytelling to demonstrate concrete examples of what parents, educators, and communities can do. And um, despite the fact that we are selling the book, and I'm shamelessly promoting it at this mm -hmm. moment against advice, um, <laughs> we, are we are actually providing the book, most of the book contents, free online at topclickread.org. So before I close, let me talk for a moment about the apps market. Uh, in the book, we call the app marketplace a digital wild west. And I think for good reason. There's now 100,000 apps or so that claim to be educational. But we found in our analysis of actually hundreds of apps that app makers and marketers aren't providing research-based advice or guidance to parents and educators. Our research shows that too often apps are characterized by a lack of transparency about who made them, a paucity of child development or content knowledge among the developers, overhyped or unsubstantiated claims about their efficacy, and sadly, a lack of evidence that they are actually designed for learning. In short, the market is failing to respond to the real literacy needs of children, especially those who are struggling learners. The app stores themselves need to step up and help, but until they do, the book offers up the best resources that now exist, including curators and review websites that are designed to help. And Natalia actually is designing something that's gonna be terrific that's coming out soon in this regard. So let me close with a question that I often get at community forums like this. How can parents help their kids gain stronger literacy skills? Well, literacy is an expansive word, getting more so, not less so, with every passing year. Even the traditional definition of literacy has always meant more than that. It means reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Children need help in becoming skillful at all four of those skills, and they can use media tools of all kinds to do so. As children grow up in a world of information overload and constant messaging, they will also need to learn media literacy and critical literacies. We conclude something that sounds simple but is fundamental. The adults and kids' lives still matter most. We must all spend time talking with, 
listening to and interacting with our children, media used intentionally can provide on-ramps to those critical conversations. In the discussion period, I'll talk about four of our policymaker recommendations, but I think I'll close by saying together we can create reading for a digital age. We can figure out a way to grow readers in this digital age. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Your, your concerns definitely travel well across the pond. Thank you. Uh, uh, moving on to Natalia, the first thing I want to say is actually Natalia is the reason we are all here today. Uh, she, uh, she proposed this as a, as a lecture via our fellowship network, so she, and she proposed some of the speakers, so she's, she's the cause of this. Uh, so thanks, thanks very much for that. Uh, Natalia is Senior Lecturer in Early Years and Childhood Studies at Manchester Metropolitan University, and she's just had something published by the Book Trust that she'll talk about today. Yeah. Thank you. Shall I go Up to you. Up to you. Uh, thanks very much, Michael, for that overview, and thank you to all our speakers. It's a privilege to be here and to be part of this timely conversation. So um, I'm just going to pick up on where Michael left off with, um, I guess, what we call in research the notion of different digital capital in families and um, the importance of contextual sensitivity when it comes to reading for pleasure and digital devices in families. So in his book, um, Michael and Lisa talk about the four C's. And I guess in research we talk about a fifth C, which would be um, the complexity or connection uh, among all these uh, different elements. And I think it's um, particularly important to talk about diversity and complexity in the diverse families we, um, we see. So the report which was um, published by Boktras yesterday talks specifically about the importance of acknowledging the different attitudes and values parents have and how they affect children's practices. Not only in relation to reading in print but also reading in um, diverse digital media um, because it is quite complex. I mean, um, Kate will tell you more about this because they do it so beautifully at Nosy Crow. Each digital book is a complex amalgam. It is a uh, digital game, it is a book, it is also a short film, it's an um, educational object, it's a piece of art, it aims to educate, it aims to entertain, so to understand that richness, we, um, we really mustn't undermine it with prescriptive guidance or um, restrictive interventions. So um, I guess what I um, advocate for is to be mindful of this richness and complexity and um, to ask more ambitious questions, more open-ended questions about the value of digital media in uh, supporting reading for pleasure. One of the questions um, I am particularly interested in is the role of personalization in children's digital books. So um, how much the possibility for children to create their own contents, to contribute their own voiceovers, texts, pictures, how much does that play a difference in their engagement and enjoyment of stories? And um, certainly my research and research of many other colleagues in um, literacy is informed by this notion of socio-technical environment. So um, an environment where we blur the, um, the division line between physical and digital books, where we don't talk about reading for pleasure versus reading for learning, but rather see them working together. And I think it's um, high time to move beyond these uh, dichotomies and, as I said, ask more ambitious questions around what we can do to support 
um, creative approaches to reading for pleasure. So um, I wish that there were more partnerships, more collaborations between academics, literacy charities, uh, practitioners, but also between parents and children when it comes to listening and honoring children's voices in, in this area. So events like today are a great start for having the right dialogue in this space. So many thanks for being here and, um, and I look forward to the discussion. Great. Uh, on to Jonathan Douglas, who's director of the National Literacy Trust, an independent charity committed to re raising literacy levels in the UK's most deprived communities. Jonathan. Thanks, Joe. Um, it's great to be here, and it's great to be talking also at a conversation about digital literacy in the context of the campaign that Joe mentioned at the beginning, Read On, Get On. This is a campaign um, which is spearheaded by a collection of 12 charities, basically committed to a step change in literacy in the United Kingdom. Is it possible to recreate, to redefine the childhood experience of literacy and reading so that every child by the age of 11 is reading well by the time they leave primary school? Um, in 2025, we've set ourselves a, a, a dated goal. It's great to be here talking about that because actually I believe that digital literacy and digital skills and the youthful experience of um, the online is actually the essential key which we need to unlock that challenge. Let me explain why. Um, it's a truism to say that literacy reflects inequality. It's a truism to say that actually every society where literacy exists, actually the rift which exists within that society between the haves and the have-nots is the rift around literacy. Brutally, that rift is created by women being refused the right to education. Brutally, that's been created historically by slaves not being allowed to learn to read and write. More subtly, in our own society, the relationship between socioeconomic status and literacy is so strong, is so profound, that it reflects and reinforces the fundamental inequality in UK society, which is about social status. In fact, the Read On Get On campaign's first piece of research demonstrated that actually the gap between literacy between the rich and the poor in terms of children in the United Kingdom is the widest in Europe with the exception of Romania. So we've got a very stark fact here that, you know, what we're talking about is a fundamental fault line in society. And when you look at international comparison studies, it's always fa fascinating to see that actually the fault line in terms of inequality, whether it's gender, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's class, in those societies is reflected by the fault line in terms of literacy. So what we've got is something which gives us that kind of critical path in terms of inequality in society. Um, so that's the first truism. The second truism is that literacy is being changed in a dynamic and extraordinary way in a, at a speed in which we've never experienced before. I, I started my professional life as a librarian and the internet was being created when I was there. In fact, my final exam to become a librarian, you had to demonstrate what the internet was using paper cups and string. Um, <laughs> and of course, the fantastic thing about the internet was it was going to be a way to publicise really good books for children. That was marvellous. And after a few years, it became apparent that actually the internet was slightly more than that and children were themselves reading online. My goodness, children were sitting in front of computers. And of course, actually, what we're experiencing now is something even more dynamic, something quite extraordinary. When the act of reading, what it means to be literate itself is being redefined. And that is immensely challenging and immensely exciting. And it's being redefined in some of the ways which Michael's mentioned, through the need for increased critical literacy, through the need to actually understand the provenance and the safety issues around the, 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 the reading interaction. But it's also being recreated in more fundamental ways than that. It's being recreated because the much more democratic nature of what it is to be a writer is being allowed by, by, um, by the, the platforms that the internet offers. It's being redefined by the fact that the experience digitally of reading is closer to gaming and to social interaction in the minds of young people and of many adults than traditional forms of reading. It's being recreated because of the convergence of formats. You know, that fantastic moment, terrifying moment, depending on your perspective, four years ago when actually 
um, the, the, the consumption of, 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 um, of video on the internet took over the mm -hmm. consumption of text on the internet. The fact that actually, as we were saying earlier, 75% of, of a marketing spend on the internet is video-based. The fact that actually, you know, what we're talking about in terms of reading for many young people on the internet now is a dynamic multimedia experience which feels social, which feels close to games, which feels in a way in which the traditional experience of reading doesn't for them. So the, the, you know, many writers, from Umberto Manguel to uh, Bruce and the Squids and Marion, yeah, have, have talked about the fact that actually what we're going through now is a seismic shift in terms of the, the identity of what it means to be literate. That is so true. So bring those two things together. The radical inequality in the historic experience of literacy, which creates and reinforces divisions within society, which is used as a way of managing societal divisions. With a new experience of what literacy is, which can potentially turn that on its head. So my excitement, my interest in this, the reason why I think this, this conversation is vital in terms of the Read on Get On campaign is, is this experience of new literacy, is the, the, the digital experience of literacy a way of reinventing a way of, of closing that, that, that gap, a way of actually um, enabling young people who potentially would not identify themselves with traditional readers to identify themselves as readers in a different way. Well, it's obviously um, you know, an incredibly complex um, um, question. It's an incredibly challenging, but there are two pieces of research I want to quickly mention which the National Literacy Trust have, has conducted, which actually I think are quite interesting in this space. The first is a piece of research which we've done with um, um, 40 schools looking at e-readers. Now, traditionally, when you do a reading promotion, if those of you who are teachers will know, in schools, what happens is that boys and girls both increase in terms of their reading activities, but girls will actually increase more. Um, we undertook this promotion in 40 schools and we allowed the schools to do what they wanted with these e-readers. Teachers, librarians were creative. Very, very exciting program. What happened though was the reverse in terms of that gender divide to what normally happens. Actually, boys accelerated more in terms of their reading skills, their positive attitudes to reading and their reading behaviours than girls did. So the, 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 the interesting thing was the fact that the digital format was used seemed to reverse the, um, the, 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 the gender distinction pattern. Very, very interesting. The second piece of research I want to quickly mention is a piece of work which we've done in the early years field. Now, obviously, in terms of you know, the, the nirvana, which we're all after in terms of early years, you know, what we're after is the interconnecting cogs of early year settings and the home learning environment working together to create language-rich environments in which young people can, can develop their literacy skills. And those two things need to work together. So we looked at, at both the home learning environment and, and at the, the home setting. We've talked to a thousand families and looked at their behaviours. What was extraordinary was that traditionally we know that poorer families are far less likely to read frequently. Poorer families are far less likely to feel confident, um, particularly around textual um, conversations around reading with their children. What was extraordinary from this piece of research was that parents from poorer backgrounds had similar levels of confidence, but actually were more predisposed to use touchscreen technology to support their children's early language development and early literacy than richer parents. So they seem to have more confidence. In fact, 43% um, of parents from the poorest backgrounds said that they would use and do use their touchscreen technology for educative purposes, as opposed to only 30% of parents from the richer backgrounds parents from the richer backgrounds actually had more suspicion around the technology. So we've got something very interesting here, very interesting, a sign perhaps, and I say, you know, bearing in mind we are in the middle of a very, very, very dynamic context, that actually the redefinition of literacy through digital experience could potentially offer us new ways um, of, 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 of actually... Uh, supporting and engaging those parts of the community and those people for whom identity suggests reading is not for them. Um, bowing to the fact that we have um, someone who brings puppets to the... the, the I wanted to, 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 to finish off by referencing Avenue Q. I'm not quite sure if any of you have seen Avenue Q. There's a fantastic song in Avenue Q, which is, the internet is for porn. 
And, um, and I think it's very interesting. When we talked to, to an awful lot of the, of the, um, of the parents in, in the research that we did, the suspicion and the fear of the internet, the suspicion and fear of the new, entirely understandable, actually outweighed their concern, their, their, their ability to appreciate its positivities. So somehow or other, I think the challenge for us at the moment is to get over those concerns, to create safer environments, to help young people master skills so they themselves can feel secure in those environments. And going back to that challenge at the beginning, use the internet to close that gap. Use the internet, use the digital experience of what reading is to enliven young people to words, language, communication, to raise their aspirations, to give them literacy that is fit for life in a new way. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jonathan. And finally to Kate, who has uh, 25 years' experience in children's publishing and, and is also CEO of N Nosy Crow, an award-winning children's book and app. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's actually 30 years. I'd like an admiring gasp. Oh. But thank you at that point. Also, some element of disbelief would be great. Um, uh, I've been in publishing for a long time. I set up the company Nosy Crow in 2010. We published our first books, ebooks, and apps in 2011. We started work on our first app months before the iPad, which is the device on which most of our apps are used, was launched. So we began work in the February, and the, and the iPad itself was not launched until um, May of 2010. So we were there at the beginning. Um, I set up Nosy Crow, well, largely, that's a whole long story because I was fired, um, but um, mainly, um, or part of the thinking behind it was that it seemed odd to be starting in 2010 and not to have digital publishing as at least part of our thinking. And in 2010, I think it was possible to imagine that mass literacy might be something of a 200-year blip. That in 1830, we didn't really expect every child in the UK or anywhere else to be able to decode text. And would we necessarily still have to, still expect that by 2030, children should all be able to decode text. Will not some descendant of Siri make it possible for them to know things, to be told things, without going to, frankly, the enormous trouble of learning to decode the black wiggles on the page or on the screen? Um, that felt quite frightening to me, as uh, uh, because I am a reader. My name is Kate Wilson. And I'm a reader. Um, and so that felt pretty scary to me. Um, and that informed a lot of our thinking around digital. It made us think very hard about the products that we wanted to bring to market. Um, Jonathan talked about, uh, very positively, about the democratization of writing. And I think that's true. The internet has made it possible for everyone to be a publisher now. And the truth is that that has also led to something that Michael referred to, which was that there was an awful lot of rubbish. Um, so on the one hand, self-publishing is something hugely to be celebrated and there's some fantastic things coming out of it. On the other hand, it makes a very cluttered market space. And my feeling was that with, if I or if we, with our decades of understanding of how children responded to pictures and stories didn't make great digital reading experiences, then a bloke in a garage in underpants in Basingstoke was going to. And so we had to think quite hard about what it was that we, Basingstoke is lovely, <laughs> Hello, the basing stokers. Um, but I'm just saying that somebody was going to do this. So we had to think very hard about what it was that we wanted to bring. And I suppose these are the principles that underlie our digital publishing. On screen, reading is competitive with other media in a way that on the page it is not. We think that some screen time should be reading time. The more time children are spending on screen, the more important it is that we present them with compelling reading experiences on screen. Children get to be better readers because they practice reading. And if some of the time they're spending is time on screen, I want some of their practice reading time to be happening on screen. Nevertheless, children have very, very high expectations of multimedia, of interactivity, and of response from screens. And particularly for younger children, it is very, very depressing as a publisher to present them with an on-screen picture book 
which might have audio, but doesn't have very much, and text and pictures, but doesn't have very much else, and watch them disconsolately pressing around in the hope that something exciting will happen, and feeling disappointed when it does not. When I say that reading is competitive with other media, I mean it's competitive with, me with other media that take into account this expectation of multimedia, of interactivity, and of response. It is therefore important that reading is not the most boring thing a child can do on the screen. And we've discovered it's not about adding bells and whistles to existing books, shoehorning wonderful books onto a screen and adding stuff. You know, if I had money for every time a prospective app author says, when you press the stars, they twinkle, um, <laughs> then I would be rich. I tell you, I'd be rich. Um, so really, it needs more than that. And I suppose our challenge, our daily challenge as app developers or as, um, developers of, re of digital reading material for children is to think, how do we use the features of the device to tell the story differently, compellingly, to use the features of the device to make sure that that's what happens. Print, however, is remarkably resilient. And uh, unlike everybody else here who kind of knows what they're talking about and you know, researches stuff and things, um, I don't, and I just make things. And, but it is true that, um, the, that commercially, um, print is extremely resilient. In the UK, children's books, but the values, the money spent on children's books last year was up by 5% on 2014, and 2014 was our highest year on record. So print is resilient. And I think that brings us also to the question of how digital can be used to engage and inform parents, teachers, librarians, and children themselves about what reading material is available, regardless of the medium in which it's delivered, whether it is print or um, on screen. And um, we, for example, are doing some work around creating games. If you were to go onto the App Store and look for My Brother is a Superhero, we've got a game that is connected to a debut novel that we published last year. And it was about introducing children to the world of that book. It was a novel, we published it as an e-book and in print, but actually the game is a marketing tool. And also, I think we're trying very hard to use the internet as a way of connecting with potential audiences and of encouraging authors to connect with potential audiences because for the first time publishing or the, the, the author and the ultimate reader or the buyer of the book there's been a kind of disintermediation of the supply chain that used to exist between them and now authors can speak really directly to the people who read their books and I think that's enormously exciting. Being a digital publisher as well as a print publisher has made me think very hard about the things that digital can do and the things that print can do well. I think there are certain things that print can do well. Um, in the end, um, Steve Jobs, or I mean now Tim Cook, I suppose, um, decides on the size of my book if I deliver it on the iPad. I can decide on the size of my book if I'm doing it in print. So I can create really, really big books and that can invite children to have a different kind of visual experience. So scale is one thing that print does really well. I think print is really physically robust. We were talking about the fact that we don't want to have babies interacting with reading on screen, but we do want them to be able to chew on a board book. So print is really important from that perspective. I think it's also really permanent. Books are permanent and they're objects and we can give them to one another. They have a kind of set of emotional connotations which um, are very significant. And I do think that they provide for an, an opportunity for deep and immersive long-term experience. Print provides that. And children, um, particularly teenagers, and there's some research to suggest that they like the holiday from screen that print reading can represent. Digital, however, um, I think does invite children, um, or, 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 different children like different things, but um, Jonathan was talking about the fact that boys are partic may be particularly invited into reading by on-screen experiences. We've had some very, very moving interactions with parents talking about how children that, who have um, learning disabilities and other disabilities are finding our apps a way into story in a way that print was more challenging. Um, I think that personalization is a really exciting opportunity in enabling the child to be part of the creative experience. I think that language is exciting. We're launching some of our apps in Chinese and Spanish next month, and that's something that we wouldn't have been able to do. And I do think access is important. 
final point. You mentioned Alberto Mangel. I was on a panel with him in Brazil, um, and he was talking about um, the supremacy of print, but somebody else there was talking about how important in a country like Brazil, which had really not got the infrastructure to get print into northern Brazil. There isn't there just isn't the bookshops, that aren't the libraries, that ultimately, with the advent of digital, with the advent of really quite cheap devices, children who would not have access to world literature could have a library in their pocket. That's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, I'm just going to ask one or possibly two questions. The first question is really to cue Michael up for some policy thinking, really. Uh, I was a, a primary school teacher when the original uh, national literacy strategy was, was introduced. Uh, and although uh, uh, it felt prescriptive at times, it was a relief to be told what to do, finally. And I just wondered in this area, uh, given we know so much more than we ever did, do we need to be prepared to be more prescriptive with schools and more paternalistic with families to get the solutions we want? No and no. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't think that we need to be more paternalistic. In fact, I think that's part of the, the issue. I, I, I think from a policy standpoint, there's five steps that I would suggest we consider here in the UK, but also things for my colleagues in the US. One is we don't really invest in young children the way that we need to. Mm -hmm. um, your country is actually better in terms of investing in preschool, but we don't have a consistent and coherent plan to focus on in these days of austerity, to focus on the kind of preventive services that can be provided beginning at birth until age eight, I would argue. So number one, we need more infrastructure in terms of early childhood policy support. Number two, it's really important that we get a little prescriptive about the ways in which technology infrastructure is being assembled. We need a digital age architecture to modernize our schools and our other community institutions. So this needs to be, in the US we have a real problem with the underconnected. For example, we released a study last week about the fact that immigrant populations and lower and moderate income families are connected, but they have spotty Wi-Fi and they um, have plans that they're being kicked off of and, and so on. So we need the technology infrastructure for the underconnected, but we also need to give teachers and other educators, librarians and museum educators, more training. These, these professionals cannot teach what they do not know themselves. They cannot use these tools. So number two, we need both tech and human infrastructure. That should be a little bit more prescribed. Um, third, we actually need to mobilize and you know, Kate's work actually stimulates some of my thinking in this area, media mentors. And they can be parents themselves and librarians and museum professionals. We need to actually assemble groups of folks in every community who can help parents navigate. Fourth, we absolutely need to um, value, especially industry, Kate, the diversity that is not being valued and the representation of many products. We've, we've just changed dramatically over the next last 20 years or so, and folks like us up on this panel are doing our best, but we are not diverse enough in terms of the designs for excellence. And we're picking up all sorts of assets in communities and in families, particularly in the U.S. and Hispanic and Latino families, which we are not representing in the products and the characters are that being designed. And then finally, um, we need more public engagement work like Read On, Get On. We've got to address the demand side. We've got to figure out a way in which we can help families and communities navigate out of the digital Wild West. And to do so will not require us being prescriptive with messages on high, but we'll take campaigns of this sort and bubble up the really interesting perspectives of the communities themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other thoughts from the panel on policy, prescription, paternalism? I did want to talk about diversity. I think it is something yeah. that's, that's very interesting and something that we are trying to do. The, the prince in our Cinderella app is Asian and um, Goldilocks is uh, the, her mother is Hispanic. Um, in, in extra the, languages. In the you, you and we're, doing, we're working on multi-languages, as I said. So um, we're really thinking, quite, we are thinking quite hard about that. I don't think we're good at representing children um, of different abilities. I think that's one of the one of the things that we have really not managed to, to, to tackle, despite the fact that we know that there are some of the children who are responding particularly well to this as, um, as a product. It's a commercially really, really, really tricky area, this, and I think that we, we're constrained by a whole set of commercial realities. And you're pontificating about policy, Kate. <laughs> <laughs>
Jonathan, anything from you? I said I wouldn't. I, I, th I, th I think the... Um, I think that the nature of public policy in the United Kingdom is so radically different now to the moment where the literacy hour was introduced and Sir Michael Barber's deliverology was the way forward mm -hmm. that, 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 that we really have to re conceptualise what effective policy in this space means. And I think there are two, I, mean, I couldn't agree more with Michael, particularly on the theme about early years, but I mean, I think there are two themes now which in this space we need to think about far more. The first is the fact that the public sector, schools by themselves, need and need support and need to work in partnership. And that partnership, when you look across the field at, you know, London Challenge, Teach First, where things are really cutting through, the nature of those partnerships is tripartite. It's public sector working with the private sector, working with the charitable sector. Mm -hmm. And those three things together create a dynamic edge which actually can really make a difference. And I think particularly in terms of this space where people are lacking with confidence and seeking new ways forward in terms of new ways of experiencing reading and literacy, absolutely true. And I think the second thing is that the, the nature of public policy in this country also now is immensely local that what works in London doesn't work yeah. in Middlesbrough, which is a place where I spent an awful lot of my life at the moment. For, and actually, the, the more we can acknowledge the fact that the community assets are the secret and the resource which will unlock literacy, unlock you know, the, 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 the skills that communities need, but actually those need to be built on at a local level, identifying the diversity of those communities, both in terms of heritage, history and ethnicity. You know, that, so, tripartite and local. Great, thank you. Um, just to emphasize, so the community assets we are talking about, we have decades of research showing that when it comes to supporting families in an effective way, we need to acknowledge different funds of knowledge. And these funds of knowledge relate to literacy, they relate to the use of digital media. So especially in the space of digital, we do need to crowdsource um, the knowledge and the information. It mustn't be top down. Thank you. Great. Uh, we'll take some questions now, first from the floor and then hopefully from Twitter, if there are questions from Twitter. Uh, we'll take the gentleman there and then the two at the back, please. Thank you. Uh, question for you, Michael. Yeah. Uh, we just wait for the three. Oh, I'm speaking about are. policy. Um, so in the U.S. last year, they announced the, the White House Open eBooks Initiative, which is huge, $250 million thing to uh, make eBooks more available to you know, lower income families and everything. So my question for you is about available and accessible are two different things. Accessible to me means like eat free books and Happy Meals in uh, McDonald's, which is brilliant. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering like, is this the right way to go about it? Because these are huge projects and these are huge things and hopefully they succeed. But if they don't, like, you know, what is the right way to go about it in your opinion? Yeah, so um, there's a big push on getting um, uh, technology equity on the right, you know, sort of the right track in, in the U.S. And this initiative is one of several that the White House has announced in sort of a great ballyhooed manner. And um, I think my worry is not so much about the design of the program, the, the intention of the program. It's the design of the program in terms of how it gets rolled out um, in communities. For example, we in, in the study that we released last week, which is called Opportunity for All? Question mark. We took a, a look at a similar program to give um, uh, community access to low-income families called Connect to Compete, basically discounted internet service and a low-cost, you know, laptop computer or tablet going to low-income families. And unfortunately, what we found is that the mismatch between the policy design at the national level and the implementation at the local level was, was great, that we did not train and support the parents themselves. We did not provide the sustenance to the educators themselves in rolling these programs out. Technology is some sort of a magic elixir is not going to change these community, these community program, the community program mix. What we need to do is introduce these programs, again, as I suggested, more along the demand side, looking at the community assets themselves. So that program, I mean, it's having some limited success, the Connect Me program, which is only being used by 6% of our respondents in the program is less of a success. The uh, partnership between Apple and Google and others with the U.S. government are all sort of adding a little bit to the mix of digital equity. But what we need is 
we need to move away from these, um, uh, what I would call sort of hot houses or rose gardens, and sorry to use this US analogy, from hot houses and rose gardens to amber waves of grain. And to do that, we need the community much more centrally involved in the design. Two over there, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, so we've talked about literacy, but I feel like we've only touched on half of what that word encompasses, which is reading. To be literate, you also need to be able to write. And I'm going to put my hands up and say, I am illiterate. I am pan-medial illiterate because I can read and interpret transmedia, digital media, all these new kinds of media, but I am unable to write. I can't respond to, say, um, an app with animation and interactivity because I don't know programming, essentially. Um, and what my fear is, is we're actually going to raise a generation of storytellers who aren't equipped to participate in this kind of, kind of cultural conversation that only companies like Nintendo or Disney Pixar are going to be able to talk because we actually can't talk back. Um, and so that's what I wanted to put to you is, of course, it's very important to have children who are Digital, digitally literate and literate in these new media, but for me that can't just be about reading, that has also to, also to be about writing. I'm not saying I expect coding to kind of come into the literature classroom, I actually don't think that at all, but just as a kind of the art classroom needs to now incorporate graphic design and those kind of things, what elements do we need to bring to the literature classroom that relate to this new kind of interactive type of storytelling that are actually going to equip our students to then be able to one day be the authors or the generators, I guess might be a better word, in, of the future. Thanks. The whole, whole thoughts on that question. We'll just have one more from the back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Diana Gerald um, of Book Trust. So welcome also with Natalia. We're launching our um, report today. Two perspectives from the panel. Firstly, how much should we be listening to what children say uh, to us? We run a program this year and last year in schools where a quarter of a million children are part of a competitive reading challenge and they can read online or printed books. And interestingly, they're 7 to 12, and they keep on shifting back between the two of them. So how can we make sure that we actually listen to what children tell us about digital and printed, as opposed to what everybody here who's over 21 thinks they should be thinking? <laughs> and the second perspective for me is, how do we use digital and printed together for quality of reading under fives? Interested in what Jonathan was saying. My nightmare, because we do a lot of work with the early years, is that we end up with almost a two-level type of early reading, where the parents who are more affluent and more connected are still reading eight books a week to their under threes, and those children pop up at five, very school-ready, and somehow we're giving something lesser to parents who are in more challenging and less confident contexts. So what do we do about that? So in summary, uh, where are we in listening to children around digital reading? And what do we do about the under fives across both digital and reading? Thank you. So three questions there. Don't feel, don't feel you have to answer all of them, but let's take uh, Kate first. I thought I'd answer um, the authorship question. I think it's a really interesting thing. Uh, my experience of creating digital material is that it's much less, you know, Kafka in a garret um, producing a thing um, and a much, much more collaborative process um, involving very different skills. Um, and certainly I don't have all of the skills. I can't code myself, but I'm very embedded in the making of the, of the things that, that we release. So I think I'd see it as being something that is perhaps potentially a more collaborative art form than um, we thought of book publishing before. But of course, a picture book is often already Axel Scheffler, Julia Donaldson. I mean, Julia just can't draw. Uh, so I don't think that's a you know, plot spoiler there. Um, uh, she can't draw. And so she needs Axel to make a thing. And the book is greater because of the combination of those two talents. And I think that we're seeing more and more as um, complex multimedia um, reading experiences emerge that we are needing, diff that we need different skills. So that idea of, you know, author ownership, I think, is something that will loosen over time. So I think that's, that would be my response to that. And it doesn't really matter if you can't code because mm -hmm. somebody may be able to code but they can't write and somebody may be able to animate but they can't draw. So there's a whole set of things that, um, of skills that are being brought to that. Um, so I think that would, that would be my answer to that. In terms of, um, just to Diana's point about listening to children, we listen to children all the time and I actually think, I should have said, it's one of the things that digital enables. Digital is also more changeable than print. We had an experience of um, creating an app where a child, it turned out most right-handed children were obscuring what was happening on screen because they were resting their hands on the screen. And we realized that just having watched children do it, and it meant that we flipped 
the screen. We would never have known about that in a book sort of context, and we wouldn't have, it would have been much harder to make the shift. So I think that we are responding. And I think, I think at, at Natalia's point about inviting children in, our next app is going to be an app which enables children to record their own speech and tell their own story. Um, I, I think I, I'd, I'd like to answer the questions by starting in a slightly different place. That's really peculiar, isn't it? Um, so I think that there is a danger that we create a dichotomy between um, the value of print and the value of digital reading. And I think that that actually now is dangerously almost embedded within our education system. So GS, GCSE English requires students to read um, text page text um, uh, material and does not allow for digital material, um, suggesting there's a hierarchy there. And I think that all the way through our system, if we're not careful, if that, if that is actually the, the assumption, we, we can end up, exactly as you say, teaching writing and literacy in one place and teaching a different kind of literacy in another. And the two things absolutely need to come together. We do a lot of work with the CBI. The CBI are always telling us that they're concerned about the literacy skills of school leavers. They don't really mean the traditional literacy skills. They mean a lot of softer skills. But one of the key themes which they do mean is actually the ability to consolidate literacy from different formats. So bringing the two, to get, two together is absolutely key in terms of the teaching of reading and writing, in terms of the experience at school, and also going to Diana's point, absolutely in terms of, 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 of early years as well. Because the, the, the reality is that actually um, the lived experience of the word combines every format now, doesn't it? So, so I, absolutely, I think if we, if we end up with, with kind of, you know, the digitally engaged being from the poorest side of the community and the traditionally, um, the traditionally engaged in terms of books from the more affluent, then we've created something that... So absolutely, from the very beginning to the very end of the education system, that dichotomy should not exist. Thanks. Um, just to add that, uh, you know, what concerns me that there are many digital products out there which support individual rather than shared engagement. So what we see more and more is that these stories do not necessarily support the development of empathy, of understanding that, you know, that people have different viewpoints, different behaviors. So it's all good to place the child in the driving seat, uh, but we mustn't let them drive alone to the new territory. And I think um, that's very important when we're thinking about developing new products, because they do need to be about this joint media engagement, something Michael and Lisa described so beautifully in their book. Um, so I think uh, that is what we really need to think um, harder about. How can we develop new digital products which support collaborative engagement between parents, children, grandparents, and which enable all of these um, stakeholders to be meaningfully involved in the experience. I'd make just two quick comments on, um, first on the lack of kid voice. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's fundamental and we're overlooking, particularly for the kids in primary schools. And um, perhaps we've missed a big opportunity with, uh, with Harry Potter. Um, in terms of listening to how children sort of, you know, voted with their feet for the, for the Potter um, uh, extraordinary experience. And I, I don't know what the story is with the Harry Potter Alliance or um, the variety of different um, parts of that. But we might want to take a look at that phenomenon again in terms of engaging, engaging kids and getting their, their voices into the mix. And in terms of this blend between print and digital and whatever is coming next, social and augmented reality and mm -hmm. who knows what's next, um, I think it's extremely important to, to note, and I've done a lot of work on early brain development, that print, I believe, will have a place forever particularly because of the kinesthetics and the close, you know, serve and return interactions that are associated with early reading when it's performed the way in which it should be. And I would, I would just say, I, I do think that digital experiences will get closer and closer to print as we involve, you know, digital readers that feel fluffier and furrier than they currently do. Um, but I want to just, I, I, want to, I want to vote for print remaining a very, very important part of the repertoire for all parents, particularly during those first three years of life. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got time for just a couple of questions. First of all, uh, there is a Twitter muse somewhere here. Are there any questions on Twitter? It's silent out there. Okay, great, we can have a couple. Only two, I'm afraid. Can we have uh, one down here? And uh, just, yeah, the gentleman behind you, thank you. 
Yes, John. Yes, both both of those. Thank you. Thank you. Fifth Bird, uh, it's been a fascinating debate. I was actually chairing a similar debate uh, in Amsterdam a few weeks ago as part of the European Literacy Policy Network, um, looking at reading in the digital, reading for pleasure in the digital age. And what was fascinating, and I think absolutely share Michael's view, we need to find out from more experts around the whole world, both in the educational research side, but also the technology experts who can inform better ways of doing things so that we can create the, the digital apps that are going to make a difference. I was fascinated by some research from the Netherlands that talked about um, the importance of the multimedia for young people. How, on one hand, it, was it could be distracting having um, hyperlinks to other areas, so they go off and read something else and they forget what they're reading about, but that also for more disadvantaged, less able uh, young people, hyperlinks could, the right sort of hyperlinks, the right sort of information, could create that, Im that information and connection and mental pictures that would motivate them to go on reading. And I think, so it's about the depth of reading and understanding better, you know, digging down deeper into how we create the right apps for the future. Because digital is part of the world, we are all doing it. Uh, there is, a, just for information, there's also a paper that's been produced, Digital Literacy by LNET, the European Literacy Policy Network, that is available to download. So do have a look at that and contribute to it. Thank you. And one last very short question, short if possible. Question. Thank yes. you. Well, it's uh, to these sages. It's about the content of what is being presented. I've, I've recently developed a, an app, an online free app, about values, mm -hmm. which we have stories, we have um, a playlist, a video playlist, but it's a question of how you get this into the curriculum, uh, although many schools are now introducing values as a, as a very good way. So just be for some advice on that quarter. Thank you. Thank you. So final, final comments from the floor, please, starting this, this end this time. Oh, Michael. gosh, such a pleasure to be here. Um, I think that we're at um, a key tipping point moment and we need to pause and reflect on the ways in which these new blended learning environments for children uh, will evolve. I, I want to just put an accent point next to the equity issues because I, I do fear that technology will be a, um, uh, unfortunately, a driver of greater gaps between the lower resourced and those of us who have access to everything and anything, anytime. Um, but that doesn't need to be the case. And I think that if we begin with early literacy and early childhood development as the most important and the most normative phase of getting it right, we will be well, we, we will be well rewarded. Okay. Just quickly to pick up on those two comments, um, I think it's crucially important that we look in more detail at the affordances of these new digital media. You know, what is it about the digital books that can engage young children and going deeper and beyond the format question? I think that's really important when we want to develop critical thinking as well as passion for reading. So. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something that Natalia was talking about, which was around the interaction and the fact that we know how very challenging for some parents interacting with a text is. And that I think one of the key areas which we've yet to fully explore is how parents who feel um, uncomfortable or challenge themselves in interacting can be supported by the inherent interactivity of, of a digital text to actually enrich that. So I think that's a, that's a very strong theme which, which for the future. Um, I stop listening because I was engaged in digital literacy. I was, <laughs> I was tweeting. Um, I guess in relation, sorry about that. Um, I guess in, to your point about, um, about, you know, how do we get these things embraced? I mean, in the end, this, the commercial models for um, digital products are really, really, really challenging. I think um, they're incredibly difficult and I live it every single day. But I do think that nobody owes anyone a living, really. And I guess the only thing we can do as makers, and I suppose I'm thinking about this purely as a maker, is that we just have to make this stuff compelling and tell people about it. And if it's compelling enough, um, and children love it enough, and teachers see the value of it enough, then they will embrace it. Thanks, thanks very much. I'm left, uh, I'm left quite optimistic about the future and that there are some solutions out there. But I'm also left wondering whether part of the solution will be around a redefinition of what reading well means 
and what the assessment and metrics frameworks around that might be. Uh, before thanking our fantastic panellists, I'm not going to talk at all about our education work, but I just want to highlight a few people in the audience who might be able to. At the back there, we've got Mark and Tom who can talk about uh, fellowship engagement and our innovative education network, Keely can as well. I can talk to you about our creative learning and development programme. And at the back there, we've got Mark and George and Alison. No, Alison's gone, who could also talk about our academies work as well. So please feel free to grab us at the end of today. Uh, I'd just like to finish by thanking all of our panellists for a fantastic contribution. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, oh, yes. And Michael's book is out there for sale. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to forget that. That's okay. <laughs>